Hi and welcome back to the channel. In the last video, we talked about all the advantages of leveraging your GPU specifically with CUDF, which is basically a CUDA accelerated version of Pandas. In this video, we're going to start working with real world data, specifically a data set from uh, Daniel Von Strien on Hugging Face called the American Stories data set. Now this has a longer history beyond Daniel Von Strien. It was originally come from a group at Harvard, specifically someone named Melissa Dell, but we're going to be exploring this data set in depth throughout this video. I'm going to walk you through some of the steps for working with this data set and downloading it in smaller bite-sized chunks, saving it locally so that you can follow along with all the other videos in this series much more quickly than having to download all 50 gigabytes or maybe streaming all eight gigabytes in one go. This will help you speed up a lot of your workflows. So that'll be the first thing that we cover. Next, we're going to talk about how to start working with QDF. And you're going to notice that the syntax that we use for QDF is identical to the syntax that we use for pandas. This is one of the big advantages of using QDF. Now, unlike my other videos on this channel, which talk about pandas specifically, this material will be a little bit different. And the reason for that is because we're working with big data in this series. And that means that we can do different things with big data, do different kinds of analyses. We can look at a larger time period and a lot more documents all in one pass. And we're going to also look at a couple different things that I didn't cover in my pandas data set video, where we talked about mainly the Titanic data set, which is much smaller in size. And the things that we do with the Titanic data set, if you want to find out about it, you can watch those videos, is very different than what we can do with a much more NLP or natural language processing style data set like American Stories. So we can do some more NLP style analysis on the text. Now, NLP analysis is typically quite quite uh, cumbersome to do with pandas, especially when you work with something more than a million rows. But because we're doing this on our GPU with QDF, it means we can get over a lot of these limitations. Now we're going to walk through a couple of the main things of both loading up that data and loading it into a pandas or a QDF data frame and putting it all on the GPU. And then we're also going to walk through some of the basic ways that you can visualize data. In other words, if you're not familiar with pandas at all, then stick around for this video because you're going to learn a lot of the pandas syntax while working with big data and getting started with it and viewing your data all in this video. Now that we're inside of our IDE, in this case, I'm using cursor, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a couple things. The first thing we're going to do is take a look at our GPU and CUDA version. As you can tell, I'm using CUDA version 12.4, and my GPU is an NVIDIA RTX 5000 ADA, which has 32 gigabytes of VRAM. This is the GPU that we're using for this entire series. Now, in order to actually load the data onto our GPU, we need to first actually get the data. So I provided for you in the repo, which is linked down below, a couple helpful, helpful notebooks for downloading some data. And we're going to be specifically working with the library data sets, Hugging Face Hub, and Pandas to do all of this. So if you want to go ahead and install everything with this cell, and then we're going to be importing all of the requisite libraries. Now I'm a huge fan of Hugging Face and the data sets library, but when you're working with really large data sets, it can sometimes be a little challenging because you have to download, in this case, 50 gigabytes if you're using data sets. And that means that it's going to take you a long time, especially if you have a slower internet connection, and you might not have 50 gigabytes available uh, to follow along with this series. Uh, the other option that datasets gives you is streaming. This is really useful if you're working with really large data sets because you don't have to download everything at once, but it makes it a little slower to load up and work with data. So I've opted in to give you a little bit of code to essentially download all this data and store it locally here in a subfolder called data. And as you can tell, I've already got this here. It's called American Stories 1938 to 1945, and it's a parquet file. So let's walk through how we actually download that data because you won't have this if you're just cloning this repository because it's too large to sit on Hugging Face. The first thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna import all of these requisite libraries. And the next thing that we're gonna do is essentially get a list of all the files that are available to us inside of this particular repo on Hugging Face, which is Daniel Von Strien's American Stories dash parquet. And as you can tell, we have 266 files here. Now, we're not interested in all these parquet files. Like I said, it's about 50 gigabytes. Instead, we're interested in a subset. We're going to be grabbing all the files that have a year value of 1938 all the way up to 1945. And we're going to iterate over each of those files and store them in a dictionary. And when we do that, we can see that we have a key value of 1938, which points to a list of files. In this case, they are all the parquet files available in this data set that point to the year 1938. 
The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to iterate over each of these files and we're going to download each one of them and save them in an empty list called downloaded data sets. And once we have done that, we'll notice that we have, in this case, all of these different data sets loaded up into a single list of data sets. Now, what we can do with this is we can pass all of these I concatenate all of these into a combined data set. And when we do that, we'll notice that we have over 4 million rows. Now this is all the data from 1938 to 1945. And then finally, we can load this into a pandas data frame by using traditional pandas syntax where we call pd.dataframe and pass in that combined data set. And once we've done that, we're able to see that the data set is in fact loaded. And we can go ahead now and save it locally. In this case, I'm saving the parquet file to the data subfolder in this repo and calling it American Stories 1938 to 1945.parquet. This is going to be the file that we use throughout this entire series, and I encourage you to follow these steps. It'll keep it on your local computer, and it's only going to be about four gigabytes. So you don't have to download all 50 gigabytes if you want to follow along. So do this first, and then join me as we pop on over to the notebook 01, getting started and begin working with QDF. Okay, now that we're in our notebook getting started, we're going to start working with QDF. And like I said before, we kind of looked at NVIDIA-SMI, which gives us all the stats on our GPU. What I want you to pay attention to right now is specifically what is sitting in memory on our GPU. Well, notice that we don't have a lot of things in memory roughly about 300 megabytes. And this is standard, just normal operations that are going on because I have a couple windows opened, etc. That, that are kind of calling the GPU. Don't worry about any of these. They're quite negligible. Let's go ahead and scroll on down, though, and begin working with uh, QDF. Now, like I said in the earlier video, there's a couple different ways that we can work with QDF. We can use the magic command. In this video series, I'm going to be sticking with the syntax of import QDF. And the reason for that is because I think it's much more explicit in what we're doing. It's much more clear that we're not using the pandas library. We're actually leveraging QDF. But really, this is a personal choice. And honestly, after you get past this first line here where we actually load up the data set, it doesn't really matter which version that or which approach you're using because the syntax is going to remain the exact same because the way we interact with this data frame class is going to be the exact same syntax. So let's go ahead and first import QDF. And we're going to load up this data set. And we'll notice that we loaded everything up in 0.5 seconds. Now, I want you to on your own to test doing this with just traditional pandas. If you were to try to do this with just traditional pandas, this time would be a lot longer. At least in my experience, that's the case. But let's go ahead now and take a look at what this has actually done for us. If we examine our GPU, you'll notice now that we've got something new down here, a new thing added onto our GPU's memory. And we'll see that it takes up roughly 4.3 gigabytes, which is what this is right here. So 4,360 megabytes. This is the entire data set that we just downloaded earlier in this video, and it's the American Stories 1990, uh, 1938 to 1948 data, 45 data set, which is roughly 4.3 gigabytes. And so this tells us that we have successfully now loaded this entire data set into memory. Well, what's the first thing that I like to do with a data set that I've never seen before? The first thing I like to do, and this is pretty common, is I want to see some basic information about it before I start diving into it and doing analysis. And so Pandas, and therefore a QDF, gives us a lot of ways to interact with that data set to start learning about it. The first thing that I like to do is run df.shape, and this tells us the rough shape of the data frame. In this case, we have the number of rows and the number of columns. So we can see that we have eight columns in our data frame, and we've got roughly 4.3 uh, million rows here. The next thing I like to do is I like to call df.info. df.info would tell us a lot of things. If we had some null values, we would see those here. But what they really tell us is a breakdown at the object level of what kind of data types that we're working with with regards to each column. So we can see that we've got, in this case, eight columns. Remember, Python is a zero index language, so we start at zero and go up to seven. And what we see here are the D types or the data types for each of these. I want you to pay close attention because this is going to be highly relevant later to the date field. Notice that it's called an object. We're going to be working with this when we start doing data manipulation later on. But for right now, we were able to see all the different fields that we have in front of us. And then finally, I think it's always a good practice to take a look at the actual data itself by calling df.head. df.head will take one argument, and this is an integer. And this is going to be how many rows that you want to see. So this is going to show you the top or the first five rows in the data set. 
And this is always nice just to get kind of a, a, a glance at what the data actually looks like. So you can kind of start seeing things. Now, one of the things that jumps out to me right away is the fact that I don't have any null values in byline, and yet I can very clearly see that I've got some empty data. This is a problem that I might need to address later on because I might want to recognize empty strings as null so I can do something with them later on downstream. But we're going to hold off on that for right now. The next thing I think is very useful is to use df.describe. Now, what makes this method really useful is it gives you a, a lot of information really quickly in front of you that you can start interrogating uh, this data frame in a little bit more depth. Uh, the first thing it's gonna tell you is the count. In this case, we are seeing that we have a full count for each one of these. Remember, byline is showing empty strings. Um, if we were seeing null values or NAND values here, we would see these numbers all being different for each one of these, but we don't have any examples of that. And so we're seeing that every single entry has all values accounted for. But like I said, we know that's probably not true. The next thing that we have is something called unique. So this tells us how many unique things are in each row. And now in this case, we see that there are 90 unique newspaper names. So that means the actual newspaper themselves. So in this case, the Waterbury Democrat, and we'll have 90 other or 89 other unique newspaper name, names included. Uh, the addition field, this is the addition. These are gonna be 01 or 02, I believe, in the entire data set. So we see that we have two different values here. Uh, for dates, these are, uh, we have 2,922 unique dates, which are going to, even though there's strings here, are going to point to a very unique date because they all follow this particular schema. And then we see that we've got 152 pages. Uh, headlines, we've got this many, so roughly half of the headlines. These are all unique. This doesn't tell you too much. And likewise, as you'd expect, uh, you have pretty much a, a quite an array of unique articles. So the next thing that we have here is something called top. This is the most commonly represented uh, unique value in the uh, unique column right here. So the most common uh, newspaper name here is Evening Star. And the frequency field right here tells us that Evening Star appears roughly, accounts for roughly half of our data set. A little over 2 million of the examples of the 4.3 million come from the newspaper Evening Star. And likewise, we can keep on combing down this list and see that page one is the most common page number, accounting for roughly 370,000 different examples in our data set. And we can see that this date is the most common date, a January 5th, 1939. And we see that it accounts for 2,797 articles in the data set. Oh, sorry, it, it appears 2,700. 197 times in the data set. So this is a great way just to get a cursory overview of some of the uh, kind of important things like counts, uniques, and top and frequency of the actual data set. Now, if we wanted to dive down and kind of get a better sense of the unique examples of newspaper name, we could use the unique method by calling DF, indexing it at the actual label or a column name of newspaper name. So we can change this and pass in article ID if we wanted to, or we could pass in page if we wanted to. But here we're gonna focus on newspaper name. What unique does is it gives us a full list, a breakdown of all the unique values that we have access to in this data set. And we can see that we've got these three dots right here. This tells us that what we're seeing is not complete. It's giving us the top five and the bottom five in the data set. That's perfectly normal. If you wanted to see all of these, you can convert it to a list. There's a couple other things that you can do here. We're gonna learn about that later on when we start exploring these things in a bit more depth. The other thing that I think is very useful to be familiar with when you're trying to get a cursory overview of a data set is to use value counts. Now this is really useful for fields like newspaper name where you know that you have a small number of newspapers across a massive data set. So out of 4.3 million examples, we see 90 unique newspapers. It might be really useful to have a cursory overview of the most frequent, their value counts, and the least frequent and their value counts. Value counts kind of does the same thing as unique, except it also tells you the uh, the counts of how often each of those unique things appear. And again, we can also convert this into a dictionary or a list to see what this looks like downstream and do something else with it. That's what I wanted to cover in this video. Hopefully now you have a good sense of the data set that we're gonna be working with. Uh, you've gotten a clear way to download that data and you also now have a good understanding 
understanding of how to start examining it. What I'd like for you to do on your own is play around with some of the functionality available to you in this notebook and take a look at some of the other statistics that you can examine with this code by simply changing out things like article, for example, which is going to give you a very much a different ex uh, set of counts and everything, as you can tell right here. That's going to be all for this video. Thank you for listening and join me in the next one when we start diving into this data set and doing more analysis on it. I am very excited because this entire series is being done on this machine behind me. This is the Dell Workstation Precision 3680, and inside of it is a beast of a setup. It's got an RTX 5000 ADA from NVIDIA. This is a GPU with 32 gigabytes of VRAM, which is more than enough to not only run inference with most of the models that I need, but also even fine tune them, models like Quinn 2 VL. This is a massive GPU that not only allows me to leverage machine learning more easily, it also allows me to do things like what we're seeing in this series, load up large data sets, thanks to NVIDIA's GPU accelerated Python packages like QDF, QGraph, and QML. So thank you so much to Dell and NVIDIA for really sponsoring this series and giving me this workstation. This workstation came installed with Ubuntu 24.04 and was very easy to set up. And I'm really excited about this because as you all probably know, I'm a digital nomad. I travel full time. I can't bring a workstation like this with me everywhere I go, despite the fact that it has a very small footprint. That said, I'm going to be spinning this up as a workstation server that I can call from anywhere I'm at in the world. So for the next few months, while I'm in Argentina, I'll be able to access this GPU and keep on bringing you content from it for the next few months. So thanks again, NVIDIA and Dell. And if you're interested in content like this, then you might be interested in the GTC AI conference hosted by NVIDIA in San Jose, California from March 17th to March 21. If you're interested, then check out the link for the GTC conference down below, where you can also find the links to the workstation that I'm using, as well as the NVIDIA card and everything else.